Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Robert Leeger, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to uh, this lecture today, at which we uh, have a, a very special speaker, Dr. Charles E. Morrison, who is the president of the East-West Center in Hawaii. He's been president since August of 1998. And Dr. Morrison has extensive involvement in the conceptualization, organization, and funding of policy-oriented educational research and dialogue projects in both Japan and the United States. He has long been involved in promoting the concept of Asia-Pacific community. In September of 2005, he was elected international chair of the Pacific Economic Cooperation Council. He's a founding member of the U.S. Asia-Pacific Council, the U.S. National Committee for Pacific Economic Cooperation, and is a member of the U.S. Committee for Security Cooperation in Asia-Pacific. He is a past chair of the U.S. National Consortium of APEC Center, uh, Study Centers, a former director of the Center's Program on International Economics and Politics, He's a former U.S. Senate aide to, Dr., uh, to William Roth, who was a Republican senator from Delaware, and some of you may be attending uh, college as benefit of Roth IRAs, um, so something to keep in mind, and uh, perhaps one of the policy originators of that kind of supportive system. <laughs> um, he's also been a research advisor uh, to binational Japan and U.S. commissions. Dr. Morrison holds a Ph.D. in International Relations from Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Um, he uh, is a native of Billings, Montana, and um, one of the things that, that he says is probably a little-known fact about him is that uh, he enjoys reading about the origins of societies and ancient history, in particular Hawaiian, Scottish, and Japanese. Not necessarily contemporary issues, but uh, certainly very interesting and fascinating ones. The title of his presentation today is Asia, Megatrends, and Implications for U.S.-Asia Policy. Dr. Morrison, we welcome you. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dean uh, Ligger. And I also want to thank uh, Dr. Jung. Uh, um, it's really a great uh, privilege for me to be here uh, in Omaha as the dean said, I am um, originally from Montana, and uh, when I was about 10 years old, I came to Omaha for the first time, and uh, that before, long before most of you were born. And uh, as a 10-year-old, I remember one main thing about Omaha, which was that it had a wonderful zoo. Uh, unfortunately, in those days, I did not think about universities, and so I was totally unaware that it also had Creighton University. But uh, of course, when I started to follow basketball scores, I uh, learned about Creighton University. And I'm very glad to be here for the uh, very first time. Um, and uh, my talk today is um, uh, just about the huge trends and uh, issues of Asia, very large uh, Asia, including uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, and South Asia, uh, an area of the world that has uh, about three and a half billion people, so more than all of the rest of the world combined. A uh, very important uh, area for the United States. And what I'm going to give you is kind of uh, like the uh, Platte River here, a mile wide and an inch deep. Uh, not very uh, profound, but hopefully uh, to help you get a sense of uh, what this region is like talk a little bit about uh, U.S. policy, and I'll even say a word or two about uh, what I think um, Asia means for uh, Nebraska. So uh, let me give a start, and if there's two themes to um, this uh, uh, talk, uh, one theme is about connecting various dots, and the other theme will be about change. And let's see, uh, speaking of change, if I can change the uh, somebody didn't give me instructions here, so uh, oh, there we go. Okay, now here's three dots, and uh, these are dots that are basically all in the same area, but uh, many of you will remember the horrible tsunami that uh, swept through the Indian Ocean, killed about 220,000 people in Indonesia and uh, 10,000 people uh, elsewhere. That was the day after Christmas in 2004. 
uh, uh, maybe eight months after that, there was a, a horrible earthquake uh, in uh, northern India, Pakistan, Kashmir area. About 70,000 people uh, died in that particular uh, event. And then in May 2008, there was another earthquake in uh, Sichuan in China. Again, 70,000 or 80,000 people uh, dead. These are just estimates. Um, those are all uh, horrible um, earthquake events. Uh, but does anyone know how the dots were connected? Well, here is the answer, um, I think. I'm going the wrong way. And uh, what had ha ha is happening here is that there is a, a, a tectonic plate. Um, this is the India plate. It's moving northward into the Eurasian plate. And one end of it is uh, Acha over on um, the eastern side. The northern end is where Kashmir is. And at the front of the plate is uh, Chengdu, where Sichuan is. And right on the fault line is Kathmandu in Nepal. Now, Kathmandu uh, is uh, a quake that we can predict with almost 100% certainty. It will be a very major quake. Kathmandu did have a major earthquake in the mid-1930s. Uh, but then Kathmandu was a city of 50,000 people. Today, it is a city of 2 million people. It has something like 1,700 schools. And I'm afraid to say that the, um, the school construction there is not very good. And so this is a disaster waiting to happen. The other theme is one of, uh, of change. And um, I uh, did this um, talk uh, initially in Salzburg, Austria. And so I used this to illustrate change. Uh, the kids from The Sound of Music. Now, they often say that there's only two things you can predict with 100% certainty uh, in life, and one is death, and the other, of course, is taxes. Um, and this uh, relates a little bit to uh, the aging process and death. But uh, I have a picture. Those of you who are uh, hearing this cannot see the picture, but the picture is of the actors in The Sound of Music, Julie Andrews, Andrews and the uh, children. And then you see the same people uh, 40 years later. Now, remarkably, Julie Andrews does not seem to change. <laughs> but uh, if there's one thing that we could have said with 100% certainty about those kids in 1960, is that 40 years later, they would no longer be kids. And so there are some things in, the, uh, in life that do, uh, are quite predictable. And, uh, and that's one of the things I want to uh, talk about is a little bit the things that are things that we can pre predict with almost close to 100% certainty, and then those things that um, are uncertain. And the areas of certainty are the continued rise, if you call it that, of Asia. Some call it the re-rise of Asia. Uh, the demographic changes in Asia, which I will talk about. The incredible pressures that uh, both development and the large population base of the region put on the resource base, both in the region and in the world, and some new health challenges. The uncertainties are really how hu the capability of human beings to manage these uh, issues, uh, whether uh, Asia can rise in a sustainable way, whether it can rise in a smooth or harmonious way, as the Chinese like to say, whether the international relations of the region can remain stable, whether Asia and Asia, together with the United States, can play the role that it will need to play as the uh, a core of the world system in, in uh, uh, providing uh, global uh, leadership. So let's start with the, um, the uh, re-rise of Asia in an um, economic sense. This is um, uh, illustration of Asia's share of uh, world gross uh, product. And it has risen since 1970 from about 15% to today uh, about 27%, uh, maybe a little bit more. Most of that has been at the expense of the European share, which has gone down, whereas the U.S. share has been uh, much more stable. But here is a, uh, a longer-term uh, perspective. 
uh, by a Scottish uh, economic historian who's now uh, passed away. 200 years ago, Asia uh, was uh, as rich a place as uh, Europe or uh, certainly North America. Um, it had 55% of the world's population, but it also had about 55% of the world's uh, gross product. And with the Industrial Revolution, that share went down and down, first uh, because the European share was rising, then because of the American share. And so the low point was really in 1950, when it was about down to 15% uh, or so, so of the world's gross product. And it has continued to come up uh, since. And probably by mid-century, Asia will be close again to at least half of the world's uh, gross uh, product. Now that's not with 100% certainty, but that's with a considerable amount of, of certainty because there are uh, underlying forces that um, will uh, make the share continue uh, to go up. So what are the drivers of uh, Asian growth? And one of the drivers is, of course, human resources and how do we measure human resources? Often we measure human resources by how many people are getting uh, higher education because those people can, uh, can uh, do uh, more efficiently uh, skilled uh, jobs. And here you can see um, the growth in um, uh, e education enrollments. Uh, the number of, uh, of young adults who are going to college as opposed to the total population of young adults has risen dramatically in virtually every uh, Asia-Pacific country. Now, the United States is uh, here as a uh, benchmark, and you can see in the United States today about 80% of the uh, college age population actually goes to college. In South Korea, uh, that figure has now exceeded. In fact, the measurement is over 100%. You say, well, how can that be? Well, some people who are older than the college age population are actually going to college, and so that's why, at least temporarily, it's over 100%. Japan is following Korea. Uh, Thailand is pretty strong, and it goes down the line. The, the weakest area is in uh, southern India, but in all cases, the uh, college-age population is uh, rising dramatically, has doubled in just a, a couple of uh, decade period, which is a, a remarkable uh, development. And as you know, going to Creighton, once you're in college, the uh, skills that you acquired are not something that go away again, but something you carry for the rest of your life. And so they help prepare, propel in a long-term sense, the, um, the rise of, the, of uh, Asia. And interestingly, this is not just uh, uh, young men who are going to college as it used to be, but young women too. In uh, many Asian societies, um, young, uh, the gender gap uh, is largely disappeared for men and women going to college. In Thailand and the Philippines, uh, there have uh, traditionally been more women than men going to colleges. In countries like Japan and Hong Kong, it has been traditionally many more men, but that uh, ratio is changing. Again, it's really in South Asia that uh, there is uh, some lag. But this is uh, very good news for uh, Asian economic development. It means that the, the human resource base is going to be across uh, uh, both genders. Now, another factor that has been uh, propelling Asian growth is uh, just integration of the region. Uh, you uh, know that uh, Europe is an area of the world that has been uh, integrating uh, very rapidly. Uh, European trade, about 60% is with other European countries. But Asian trade is over 50% with other Asian countries. In fact, there's more trade among Asian countries with each other than there is among the NAFTA countries, Mexico, Canada, and the United States uh, with each other. Uh, the reason for that is the rise of production networks uh, in Asia. So a uh, good, in order to be produced, may have parts that come from Taiwan, parts that come from mainland China, parts that come from Japan, and so forth and so on. So there's a lot of trade going around the region before the final product 
uh, may be consumed locally or still a vast majority of more sophisticated manufactured projects, products go to uh, North American or European uh, markets. And this has been a important driver of economic development uh, in the region. And other drivers include uh, capital investments. Uh, the traditional uh, drivers of economic development are land, labor, and capital. We've talked about labor. Land doesn't change so much. But uh, when you see the accretion of capital uh, infrastructure in Asian countries, it's rising dramatically uh, compared to any other region of the world. The expansion of the middle class is very important for uh, future Asian growth. Middle class uh, tends to be large consumers. Um, uh, in the initial development phase, uh, export markets are very important, but that's not a sustainable basis for economic growth. And so you need domestic sources of growth, and that comes from the middle class. And finally, of course, affecting the whole world, including the United States, is the uh, communications revolution, telecommunications. Uh, but in Asia, it occurs much more fa quickly than here because it starts from such a low base. This is catch-up economic development. And so a country like China, certainly a country like India, is still in a catch-up phase. Japan, 20, 30 years ago, was in a catch-up phase, and its uh, economic development was very rapid at that time. But once it had caught up, development just went uh, was at the frontier, and Japan couldn't go beyond that. So for China and much of the rest of, uh, of developing Asia, they are in this uh, catch-up phase. And the growth will continue to go up for many decades, but uh, at a slower pace uh, gradually. So let's turn to another um, uh, part of uh, the uh, overview of uh, what's going on in uh, Asia. And this part is uh, a very interesting about demography. There's probably one thing that you learned uh, very early about Asia. One of the first things you heard was that Asia has lots of people. Uh, and that is true. And uh, China, of course, is still the most populous uh, country in the world. And if you take a, a, a province of China and try to match it to a country, you can actually put a good deal of the world into China. Here's uh, um, uh, uh, southern China. Um, that's equivalent of Germany. Here's um, Yunnan, uh, the equivalent of Colombia. Um, uh, now, there are some parts of China that are not very uh, populous. So Inner Mongolia has a population of North Korea. The real North Korea is quite small compared to the Inner Mongolia surrogate of North Korea, or Jamaica as a population of Tibet. But uh, Tibet, of course, is much uh, larger than Jamaica. You could do so the same thing with India. India, uh, in 20 years' time, will have more people than China. So India will surpass China as the most populous country in the world. But even though these countries are very populous, uh, they, the population rates of growth are declining declining very dramatically, and in some cases have even reversed. In Japan's case, the absolute number of people are now in decline in Japan. In uh, the 1950s, the average woman in uh, a country like uh, China or Korea had five babies during her lifetime. The average uh, woman today in Northeast Asia has 1.2, 1.3, 1.5, whatever. It's, it's not even replacement level. And so you see what happens is that the uh, birth rate has tapered off very rapidly, and then it becomes more stable. Southeast Asia, the same thing is happening. Again, South Asia is uh, a little bit uh, behind. But this is a, uh, a, a trend, the decline in so-called fertility rates which has happened previously in Western Europe, has happened in North America. But in those cases, it uh, happened over decades. In this case, uh, it's happened in 20, 30 years, a much more telescoped uh, period of time. And that has real major implications for um, all kinds of, uh, of things. The aggregate amount of population in East Asia will continue to go up 
until about 2025, and then it will uh, taper off and even start to decline. In Southeast Asia, the rate of increase is declining, although it will continue to go up for a while. It's only in South Asia that you'll have a continued uh, strong uh, growth in population over the uh, next uh, 50 years. And it's not just that, uh, that fertility is declining, that people are not having babies. The most remarkable development, I think, is that people are not getting married in the first place. And this is a illustration of um, the uh, rates of, of marriage of women who are in their upper 30s. These are not women who are married and divorced, but women who never got married. And that figure is something like 15% in Japan. Um, and, but in cities, it's, it's much higher. So in Tokyo, 30% of women in this age category, 35 to 39, have never been married. Uh, in Bangkok, almost 30% of women uh, in this age category have never been married. And those women who have never been married are not having uh, children. And so we don't know exactly what the reason for this is. Many people have a lot of speculation about it and whether it's something that is temporary or will continue. But it is a important phenomenon in the region. Again, looking over the period of 30 or 40 years, uh, these rates of, of, uh, of being single have uh, continued to steadily uh, increase uh, throughout the region. And the changes in fertility uh, obviously affect, affect the uh, population composition. Now, most countries, and developing countries in particular, uh, have a population that if you measure the number of people every five years, or you measure the five-year increments of cohorts of people, you'll have something that looks like a pyramid. Not very many old people, but a lot of young people. What's happened in Japan is that uh, that pyramid structure has uh, changed, and now it looks like pretty much a sky skyscraper. Uh, Old people equal about the same number of young people. But if you look at projections of Japan in 2050, uh, for almost 40 years from now, there'll be many, many old people compared to the number of young people. This is a frontier in human history. No other society is this far advanced in the change of its uh, demographics. But it obviously has very great implications for social security systems, for uh, medical care systems, for politics in a country, for innovation in a country. It's something that we don't know about because it's never happened before in human history to have a society that looks like this. But where Japan is going is where Korea is going, where Taiwan is going about 15 years later, where mainland China is going about 20, 25 years later and perhaps where uh, Southeast Asia is going to. The United States, incidentally, is not nearly as extreme. Partly it's because we have immigration, a healthy amount of immigration in this society. And for some reason, the birth rate, uh, fertility rate in the United States um, is, is high compared to uh, Asian countries or compared to uh, Western European countries. Countries like Italy, uh, Spain, uh, Sweden also have fertility rates that are uh, uh, very low and below uh, replacement levels. And while many countries try to have tax incentives, other benefit incentives to encourage people to have babies, um, they rarely have uh, worked. Now, what this means is that the share of young adults will be decreasing in Asia. The share of young adults in the population actually has been increasing, and this has been one of the drivers of growth. It's called the uh, youth bulge, but it will soon become a kind of youth uh, bust. And uh, the number of, say, workers in Japan in mid-century will be about 25% less than the number of workers in Japan now. Uh, those in China will be about 10% less. And so the uh, labor uh, 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 number simply will go down. And this will, of course, have an impact on the growth rate. And most importantly, the uh, number of elderly in the society go up. Uh, Japan today, about 7% of its population is, uh, consists of people who are older than age 75. 
So the standard uh, age that we think of senior citizens is 65, but let's just use 75, 7% of the population. That's an old society today. But Japan in 2050 will have about 22 or 23 percent of its population that is over 75 years of age. And for other Asian societies, that figure is also, uh, will be increasing very rapidly. The other major trend, uh, uh, along with the uh, fertility trend, is the growth of urbanization. Asia, uh, uh, say 20, 30 years ago, was one of the least urbanized of world areas, certainly compared to Europe or compared to North America or compared to Australia, which is the most urbanized area. Uh, Asia, most people lived in rural areas, uh, but uh, it's rapidly uh, urbanizing now. About a billion and a half of the uh, Asian people now live in cities. That figure is expected to ri uh, ri rise to about 3 billion of, say, uh, 4.5 billion people by the year uh, 2050. So the growth of urbanization is a, uh, a major phenomenon. Um, and you can see it just by uh, the number of cities that are so-called mega cities, over 10 million. If you look at East Asia and Southeast Asia, and I'm neglecting South Asia right now, in 1950 there was only one megacity, Tokyo, which today is still the largest city in the world, just in terms of the urban uh, agglomeration. By 1975 there were four uh, Asian cities, over 10 million, and now there's something like uh, at least 10. Uh, and I think it depends on what you count as a city. And I think the Chinese numbers are often understated here. There's a so-called floating population in China that are not, is not reflected in many of these numbers. But you can just see that these cities are, um, are rapidly growing. And the same is true in uh, South Asia. Uh, by mid-century, uh, certainly, but much before that, I think Mumbai uh, in India, Bombay, will be the world's largest city with about 40 million people in the Bombay uh, area. Uh, and the reason people fled into cities is that it's a very um, uh, efficient way to organize an economy. They're very rich in terms of cultural um, activities. It's, uh, it's a very attractive uh, lifestyle. And we forget that just a city can be an enormous uh, part of uh, a country's economy. The city of Tokyo has a greater gross product than the whole country of South Korea or of Australia, or Canada, uh, the city of Hong Kong, or of Seoul, more than Vietnam. And Vietnam has 90 million people. So this gives you a sense of the enormous economic impact of, uh, of, of these cities. Um, but cities also have downsides. And uh, one, one thing that we obviously know about is, uh, is automobile uh, crowding and uh, uh, traffic jams, uh, but also particulate matter in the air. If you take the world's top 10 cities for polluted air, only Cairo in Egypt is uh, outside the Asia Pacific region. Virtually all the rest are either in India or in China. Uh, Jakarta also figures in this uh, top 10 group. It's not a very nice group to be in, and, and Asian cities are definitely working on this to try to reduce it, but it's a downside of being in the city. And another is that you, as you collect people in uh, a dense area, they are peculiarly vulnerable to disasters, whether natural disasters or man-made disasters. And it, this is a map, um, again, I'm sorry for uh, people on the radio who can't see it, but it shows uh, a whole bunch of disasters in Asia over the last 20 years, uh, floods, uh, windstorms, volcanoes, uh, tsunamis, and you put the megacities on and you can see that most of the megacities are in areas that are vulnerable to disasters. Acha in Indonesia, where the uh, tsunami in 2004 was most devastating, uh, is an area where people have moved down from the mountains and into the city, into Banja, Acha, which is the main city. And so uh, they didn't have the historical knowledge that the people along the coast side had about tsunamis. And they were very densely clustered compared to the path. 
And this, and this is what you have. You have a region that is actually becoming more vulnerable to natural disasters, more um, uh, building for uh, disasters. About 80% of the people in any one year affected by disasters are Asians. Now I'm going to turn uh, to some of the resource issues. And as uh, mentioned, uh, you know, what are the dots here? The dots are uh, not, it used to be that you'd read a textbook and it'd say, um, Asia is resource rich. Well, resources are relative. <laughs> and when you have a lot of people, and when those people use a lot of resources, you change from being resource rich to resource poor. China, 25 years ago, was an oil exporting country. But China wasn't using that much oil for itself. Now China is very poor. It's one of the major oil importing countries in the world. And so rather than being a resource rich country, it's a resource poor country. So the dot is, um, is resource use, it's population, but most importantly, it's economic development. And you can see that uh, Asia Pacific already is the largest oil importing region in the world. And that uh, figure will uh, increase uh, so that Asia will, in fact, will increase much faster than, um, than these projections uh, by the Congressional Research Service uh, uh, suggest, because uh, the amount of uh, natural gas uh, being now um, uh, extracted in North America will substantially affect uh, the figures. But Asia will definitely be uh, uh, equivalent to Europe plus uh, North America as a oil and gas importing region. And what's driving that is uh, the uh, growth of, of, uh, of, of air conditioners, of automobiles. Developing Asia will have as many automobiles as the rest of the world combined in 20 or 30 years' uh, time. And the uh, amount of resources compared to the population in oil and gas is very small. Asia has a substantial amount of coal. Both China and, uh, and India have a large share of coal. China has about 13% of the world's coal reserves, India about 10%. But uh, China has only about 1.3% of the world's oil reserves. India has maybe half a percent equivalent for a natural gas. So there's no way that the resources of these countries, domestic resources, are going to be uh, uh, compensating for the growth of uh, demand. Another resource that's heavily under pressure is water. Um, I think uh, living here in uh, Nebraska, you can appreciate that water is uh, can be a, a scarce uh, commodity. Uh, the parts of the world that are plentiful in water tend to be in the uh, north. The parts of the world that have moderate supplies tend to be toward the south. And then there's kind of a belt of areas where there's um, very uh, scarce water resources per person. This is per capita water resources. And much of it is in the places that you'd expect the Sahara Desert, the Gobi Desert, uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, not much water, but not many people either. But then you have places like northern China, parts of India and Pakistan, where you also have not much water, but you have hundreds of millions, tens of millions, and even hundreds of millions of, uh, of people. So the amount of water per person in these uh, areas is extremely limited to begin with. And then you have industrial growth, you have changes in diets, you have other things that affect uh, water use, and the scarcities become uh, much, much uh, larger. So northern China has a, um, about 65% of uh, China's arable land. It has almost half the population. It provides almost half of the gross national product. But it only has a fifth of China's uh, water reserves. So what do you do? Uh, the Chinese say, well, let's move water from central China up to northern China. They have a great scheme to do that, but um, it's uh, very hard. It's hard for, uh, uh, be hard anyway, because as it moves north, people tap it out along the way. Uh, but it's hard environmentally. And so there's uh, a lot of, of rethinking about uh, those uh, schemes. Uh, I'm sorry for those who can't see it, but uh, this is an illustration of 
uh, by a, a Chinese cartoonist of what uh, the water situation is like in northern China. And it shows a well with a very little rope that grandfather had. And now grandson has a well, but it has lots and lots and lots of rope because the water table has uh, dropped so much. And of course, one of the drivers of that is a change in diets. Uh, the average Chinese, 1990, uh, uh, consumed about uh, nine pounds, or uh, sorry, about 40 uh, pounds of, uh, of meat on a yearly basis. And that figure has gone up about 250%. And to produce meat, uh, it is much more water intensive than to produce the calorie equivalent of uh, wheat or rice. Now I'm going to turn to a final area, and uh, this is about health. And uh, I'm not a health specialist, so uh, I have, uh, don't want to, um, don't take this too much to heart, but I try to divide it into uh, three areas that make sense to me. Uh, there are traditional health diseases, diseases like cholera, uh, that uh, peculiarly affect um, women and, and, and children, and uh, as a result, often of bad sanitation, ignorance about disease, and so forth. Throughout Asia, uh, traditional health risks have gone down in terms of salience. Um, and in fact, a disease like cholera, almost uh, non-existent in, in most of the region now. And then there are infectious diseases, including uh, new infectious diseases and re-emerging infectious diseases like tuberculosis. And these are diseases that um, in many respects have gone down, but are uh, subject to um, uh, outbreaks at uh, any possible time, and in fact, this region is, as I'll explain in a moment, one of the um, fault lines, if you will, of, uh, of health uh, uh, pandemic uh, challenges. And the third uh, area is chronic conditions and diseases, and these are largely associated with lifestyle changes, and they would incur, in, include diseases like uh, diabetes, like uh, cardiovascular diseases, and mental uh, uh, health. Now, if we take infectious diseases, uh, many of the infectious diseases that we know about uh, have arisen in, uh, in Asia. Not HIV AIDS, but the Spanish flu in uh, 1919 uh, 19 and 1920, uh, the largest pandemic uh, uh, ever known. Millions of people around the world were killed uh, why is it called the Spanish flu? It's because a member of the royal Spanish family died. Uh, but it actually originated in Guangzhou by uh, all accounts, and so from China. The Asian flu also originated in southern China. Bird flu uh, appeared in Hong Kong. SARS appeared in Hong Kong, came from southern China. Uh, avian flu from northern Southeast Asia, Vietnam and southern China. Swine flu, there's some uh, dispute whether it arose in Mexico or whether the infected pig originally came from China again. But just an awful lot of diseases have come from uh, uh, Asia. And there are some very good reasons for that. Um, you have uh, an awful lot of people uh, in the region. And you have an exploding animal population. If you took 40 years ago, the population of China over that period of time has not quite doubled. The population of pigs in China over that time has gone up 500%. And the population of ducks has probably gone up 1,000%. And it's, again, people eating uh, more meat. Here is, I don't think, a very accurate map, but it, uh, it shows the poultry uh, production in, uh, in uh, Asia. And as you can see, much of it is concentrated in China, in Vietnam, in Bangladesh. And these are areas where um, you really have to um, uh, kind of track uh, what's going on and whether uh, uh, chickens or ducks or geese are uh, getting uh, a, a virus. Because where you have a lot of animals and you have a lot of people densely uh, packed together, the, uh, the way a new virus um, generally comes to the human population is through the animal population. So the chances are much higher there than in many other uh, parts of the world. But economic development is affecting this in another way, too. We have at the East West Center a, a little research team 
that looks at Vietnam. And they are looking at the land use in Vietnam and at the disease vectors in Vietnam. And what they're finding is that in the cities, not so much change. In the countryside, not no, so much change. But in the so-called peri-urban areas, which are the areas around the cities where, the, um, where there's lots of changes and the trees being cut and the farms converting into factories and so forth, that's where these uh, disease vectors are um, uh, originating. So um, this is something that we're still looking into, but it's, um, it's both fascinating and also points to uh, an area where we should be monitoring very uh, carefully. The problem in anything like an a infectious disease is you, you can, if it's in a, uh, a country like uh, rural Burma or parts of Vietnam, you're going to have a whole village wiped out and the uh, disease will already have uh, spread so much that it's very hard to control it. Fortunately, we've been lucky with SARS. Um, it was uh, looked like it was one of a disease that could spread very quickly around the whole world, and in fact, it uh, was contained with about 800 uh, cases. Now, I mentioned uh, lifestyle changes, and I love Japanese statistics. The Japanese in 1987 did a survey of uh, how long it took 11-year-old uh, girls and boys to run 50 meters and how far they could uh, throw the softball. And 20 years later, they did the same survey and they, both the boys and the girls couldn't run as fast as they did before, and they couldn't throw the softball as far. So what do you think is the reason for that? <laughs> They've been playing video games. <laughs> they have much less exercise than they uh, used to have. And this is something that, again, we have lots of data on this uh, is occurring, especially in city areas uh, around the region. And this will show up later in cardiovascular diseases in uh, diabetes and so forth. Of course, one of the other things that kids are doing is eating a lot more sugar uh, than they used to, and this affects uh, diabetes rates. And so uh, throughout Asia, but especially at South Asia, you have an explosion of uh, di diabetes uh, cases. Now, another area is the uh, mental health area. It's one I don't know how you measure, but um, the one measure that I thought m might give some clues is uh, suicide rates. I just assume that people in a modern, uh, fast-changing economic situation with a decline in the extended family um, are going to suffer a lot more uh, mental health. And if you look at suicide rates around the world, there are some places that traditionally had high play, uh, suicides like Finland and Hungary and Japan. Uh, but there's been a, a a large growth in reported suicides in many developing Asian countries, including China, including Thailand, and especially including uh, Korea. Here's, uh, in case of Korea, uh, the uh, suicide rate um, was below that of the United States, which is about here, substantially below that of Japan, which would be more about here. Um, but it's uh, gone up uh, tremendously, and uh, with uh, one spike uh, at the time of the 1998 economic crisis in Korea, went down again, and then it started uh, rising again. And now Korea has the highest reported suicide rate uh, in the world. Now, this may be partly just statistics. It was a, in Asia, a lot of families would hide suicide in the past because it was considered um, uh, uh, socially unacceptable. Uh, the Japanese didn't, and that's why you see the higher rates in Japan. But I think there's something uh, else that uh, is going on, because even in a short period of time, you see um, this kind of rise. And it is so general in the region. But it may be different in different places. In Korea, middle-aged men. Uh, uh, traditionally in Korea, the um, backbone of the family nowadays often uh, lose their jobs in their 50s, and so much more psychological pressure on them. In China, uh, one uh, problem is young women in the countryside. The men have gone off to cities to find other jobs. The women are left with a hard uh, farm work and uh, taking care of the, trying to keep the families together, take care of the old people, 
and there's lots of pesticide available. And so you see this is a, uh, a form of suicide. But one way or another, I think the people are going through enormous uh, changes in their uh, in the life around them and having to adapt to that, and that's putting a lot of pressure on them. Now, I've used a lot of time, so I'm going to go kind of quickly to the uh, uncertainties, and I'll just highlight uh, various areas here, but they're all pretty clear from the, the presentation that I've uh, made. Uh, obviously, in an area that is uh, as densely populated as Asia, which is using its resources, sustainable development becomes uh, a, a big issue. And um, okay. And uh, let's see, I'll skip that one. And you can see that um, uh, when it comes to carbon emissions, China is now actually by far the largest source of uh, carbon dioxide emissions in the world. It passed the United States only about three or four years ago. But uh, China is a, a developing country. And uh, obviously, if it, as it develops its industry, um, and it has still uh, lower standards than uh, more advanced countries, uh, this uh, uh, amount of carbon dioxide will continue to go up. And this is true also of other uh, developing uh, countries in Asia. So Asia has become the largest uh, source of carbon emissions. But the question is how people in the country perceive the problem. And if you're a Chinese, you say, well, look, the average Chinese is uh, uh, pro providing only about a quarter of the average American's carbon emissions into the atmosphere. So the US, Canada, Australia, all large countries, lots of land area, people drive around a lot, uh, uh, very wasteful lifestyles by tradition. On a per capita basis, much uh, greater emissions than uh, an Asian country like Japan, which is one of the most efficient countries in the world at the income level that it is, and certainly China and India. So you ask people, well, uh, who's creating the problem? And Americans say, well, China is creating the problem. China is now the largest and is growing the most rapidly. And Chinese say, no, the United States is the problem. They have to deal with their issue before we deal with our issue. And the Japanese and Koreans are downwind from China, and so they say, well, clearly China is a problem. And the Indonesians um, are a little bit like China and where they're going, so they say that the United States is a problem, another developed country. And the Germans are far away from both of us, and so they say, well, it's about equal, both your houses. But the problem is when you have uh, people with different perceptions about where the problem is arising, it's very hard to get them to agree on a, a common approach. Now, another area that's going to be a very significant uh, issue, I think, for Asia is income uh, uh, inequality. Uh, Gini was an Italian uh, economist who lived about 100 years ago. Uh, he developed a, uh, a measure that is used by the World Bank and many other uh, uh, organizations to measure in income inequality. And the lower the figure, the more equal the society. Europe and Japan have some of the lowest figures in the world. The Latin American countries have some of the highest figures for income inequality. The US has a relatively high but somewhat stable figure. China, and, and these are Chinese statistics. This come from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. The Chinese figure is rising very rapidly. And this is. Um, a rise that is not just uh, coastal provinces versus internal pro interior provinces, although there's a lot of that, but even within the cities of China and so forth. And so this is a major concern for uh, Chinese leaders because uh, it's a question of social stability in the end. And it's in a, um, a society where uh, if you get rich, it's not necessarily because you worked hard and, or you were, had the best idea but maybe because of your connections and your um, uh, political uh, influence. OK, now another area that is um, clearly um, an issue for the future, it is now, is governance. Um, and uh, while Asian countries are often old, like China, Japan, Thailand, are uh, centuries, not millennia, 
oh, many of the uh, uh, state systems, the political systems, are new. The oldest uh, political systems in uh, Asia are 50, 60 years old. Japan, the constitution from the post-war era. China from the, uh, uh, the Maoist revolution, 1950. Um, Thailand, they've had uh, something like 15 constitutions in the last uh, 40 years. Uh, South Korea and Taiwan were both uh, military dictatorships until only about 25 years ago. Indonesia was until only about 10 or 12 years ago. And so you see uh, this is a very different situation than, say, the United States, where you've had a lot of evolution, but you've had the basic constitution and political system in place for 200 years. These are countries that are still kind of working out the role, issues like the role of religion, the role of, of uh, the military, um, uh, how the judiciary should be organized, um, uh, uh, whether it's a democratic uh, system as we understand it or, or something a little bit different than that. A lot of evolution uh, still going on and, and major issues to be uh, settled in these countries. And then one thing you are uh, aware of, I think, especially in recent weeks, is the, still the amount of international relations tensions uh, in the region. Um, now, does anyone remember the last war between two Asian countries? The very last one. OK, uh, the reason you don't remember is because um, it's been over 30 years. Uh, the last war, which was a very minor one, was between uh, Vietnam and China. Uh, in 1978, so more than 30 years ago now. And you had those between uh, India and Pakistan. But since then, it's been tensions. It's uh, occasionally border incidents, like between Cambodia and Thailand. And so that's a good thing. But you also have uh, uh, rising uh, ethno-nationalism. And that's what we're seeing in, uh, in China, Northeast Asia, between China, Korea, and Japan over some of the territorial and uh, maritime disputes. You have this question of the Philipp of uh, the Korean Peninsula, and uh, that's a relic of the uh, end of uh, World War II. It's not been resolved. Uh, you have uh, cross-strait relations still, although they've improved very much. Um, this region is one where regional organizations uh, are still in their infancy. And the biggest question, I think, in the end is whether this region can provide some form of uh, global leadership. I think that leadership has to inevitably come from the United States for decades to come. But the United States can't do it alone. And it needs, uh, the, since the weight of the world economy uh, is not transatlantic anymore, but trans-Pacific, the leadership has to come from trans-Pacific. Uh, and uh, that involves adjustments for us. It involves adjustments for Asia. For Americans, the uh, adjustment has to be to take others into account in a real way and to uh, understand what cooperative leadership is about. For Asians, it's really to think about not just national development, but to think about the global systems and uh, how do you protect in your own national interests uh, the global systems. Um, how are uh, US and Asia doing in terms of their relations? Well, generally, uh, pretty good. Uh, but Asian views of the United States tend to be more positive than American views of Asia. There is a tendency in this country, I think, to view Asia as a threat. Uh, Asians um, uh, often have uh, angst about the United States, but, uh, but there's a lot of what we say in Hawaii, aloha, or positive feelings also toward the United States. Uh, if you look at ad attitudes over time, uh, it's improved in many countries. India, particularly Japan, South Korea, uh, but very poor still in Muslim countries like, uh, like especially uh, Pakistan, where um, uh, we're involved in ongoing uh, military operations. U.S. policy in Asia has not been uh, one that has been very partisan. There's an awful lot of uh, consensus across the uh, 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 different. Um, Republican and Demo Democratic uh, administrations in the United States, um, even though there's two basic approaches. One is to think of Asia largely as a threat. Is, is it a threat to our security as a big country like China is rising? Is it a threat to our economy as lots of manufactured goods or investment is coming from uh, Asia? 
the other approach is to think about um, uh, Asia as a partner in order and as a uh, area of uh, uh, great opportunity. And then the challenge becomes, of course, always to uh, be cognizant of the threats, but also to work with Asia in trying to develop um, uh, a regional and uh, global order. And that second one has been the dominant uh, ma uh, mainstream uh, thinking, both in the Bush administration and in the Obama administration. In both administrations, there was uh, uh, an effort to strengthen our alliance system. The basic allies are Japan, Korea, Philippines, Thailand, Australia, uh, to put more effort into regional organizations, the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, ASEAN, which is Southeast Asian nations, to try to build uh, cooperation with China while defending our interests, and developing uh, a broad free trade agreement this Trans-Pacific Partnership was a proposal of the Bush administration, uh, ignored the first year by the Obama administration, and now picked up in the Obama administration is uh, trying to uh, finish the negotiations. There have been some differences. The Obama administration has probably made more effort to show up to multilateral meetings. They tried an approach toward Burma, which actually has been, uh, it's not because of them necessarily, but it's been pretty successful. Uh, in reaching out to Burma. North Korea, they tried to ignore more, whereas the Bush administration put a lot of effort into North Korea and got nothing for it. And then the Obama administration has tried something that initially they called the pivot and is now called rebalancing. And it basically means that this is a region of the world that's most important to the United States systemically uh, over the next few decades. And so our resources that are devoted to foreign policy, defense policy, should really be focused on this region. And as our commitments to the Middle East go down, hopefully uh, uh, we'll rebalance toward uh, Asia, not toward uh, Europe. The biggest problem for the United States is that we still are the largest country in the world in a super power sense. And so there's a, a tendency, and this, is, this will be for any country that was in this position, to, for others to feel that we're arrogant. And uh, certainly some of us are from time to time. Uh, the pivot has uh, various elements. Uh, I think the military part has been received most of the attention. The economic part is very important. And the social cultural part is uh, almost ignored in our rhetoric, but uh, it uh, uh, has to be a big uh, part of it. And that involves uh, relationships of people with each other. And universities, I think, uh, play a very important role in that. Um, if you look at a state like Nebraska, you can see how important Asia already is. Uh, Nebraska has 1.3 billion in exports to uh, Asia. Most of that actually is manufactured goods. You might think it's farm goods, but it's not. It's manufactured goods. Uh, this is an estimate of more than 4,000 jobs that depend on those uh, manufactured goods. Uh, this is a figure that the Institute of International Education puts out, more than 2,000 uh, students from Asia, about half of the international students uh, in Nebraska come from Asian countries. And if you consider what they're paying in tuition, which can be pretty high at a university like Creighton, or consider um, what they're spending on, uh, in the community, uh, they're an uh, enormous contribution to the community. And you have the sister city and sister state relationship. You have many other kinds of relationships, commercial relationships. Uh, cultural relationships that uh, connect uh, a state like uh, Nebraska to uh, the Asia Pacific region. So each of you, I think, uh, particularly you students, if you, you think about uh, when you woke up in the morning, uh, you wonder how much Asia affected you, uh, probably quite a bit, especially if you look at uh, the uh, appliances that you're using and, and uh, so forth. So I think that uh, it's really uh, gratifying for me to come to uh, Creighton and see the, uh, the Asia uh, World uh, Center here, because I think this is just exactly the kind of thing that is needed, both to help educate Americans, because for Americans, uh, Asia will continue to be the most important region and will become far more important to our future in 20 or 30 years, even than it is today. And I think giving uh, the opportunities for young Asians to come to the United States, experience this culture um, is uh, very important. Unfortunately, it's still one way. 
uh, there's a lot more Asians coming to the United States in higher education than are Americans going to Asia. So one of the efforts of the Obama administration has been to push something they call 100,000 strong, is to try to bring American students over to China. Uh, most of those will not be degree students, but just uh, short-term uh, students. But I think that will, no matter who wins the election, it will be a continued effort that uh, Americans will try to do. Now, some of the implications of this, I think we still need a lot more work on Asian understanding in the United States than we are giving it. As I mentioned, we need uh, uh, to try to broaden this out into uh, the public uh, realm more. Uh, institutions like these regional institutions are essential because otherwise you're inventing uh, the wheel each time. And the most important element is uh, leadership, leadership at all different kinds of uh, levels. Uh, but especially leadership to deal with the big challenges of the region. Um, and that's a big question for Asia, is whether, uh, given the enormous challenges they have, the much more rapid demographic change than the United States, the much greater pressure on resources of all kinds, uh, the need to rebalance economies away from uh, simply export-driven economies to ones that are more uh, healthy in terms of a, a domestic uh, uh, content to growth. Uh, innovation systems. Um, these are all enormous challenges, and the question is whether the leadership will be up to that. So sorry I took most of the time, but hopefully there's a little time left for any comment or question. Well, um, please join me um, in thanking Dr. Morrison for this wonderful presentation. I'm going to be um, present, going to present Dr. Morrison with this thanks uh, symbol <laughs> on behalf of um, Asian World Center and uh, at Creighton University. Do you think they'll allow me to? <laughs> you have to carry it back to your home.